Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I am going to be talking about how to capture food. Uh, my name is Heidi Richter, and um, we do have quite a bit to cover today. So I'm going to start by sharing a brief outline of my presentation. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce myself, and then I've divided this presentation into um, three parts. The first part being the basics, um, so the tools and gear that you're going to need for capturing really great food images. And part two is going to be the components of food photography. So how do you style, compose, and uh, light your scenes? And then part three is going to be um, a scene study. So I'm going to show you how all the components of food photography work together to create a cohesive image. And then lastly, I'm going to share some insider tips and troubles, troubleshooting um, as it pertains to uh, food photography. So just to give you a little bit of my background, so I am a food photographer. Um, I am also a stylist. Um, those two sometimes go hand in hand. Uh, I've been doing this for about seven years now. I kind of can't believe that. Um, and I'm also based on uh, Vancouver Island uh, in British Columbia, Canada. So my journey into food photography started with just a really small food blog um, and a phone camera. And it's really kind of snowballed um, over the years. And I've uh, now been working with large and small brands from all across the globe, as well as locally. Um, I've worked with brands like Vitamix International and now obviously Nikon Canada, which is really awesome. And I obviously have a real deep love for photography, um, for food, for gardening, um, and I love to tell a really good story through my images. So just to give you um, sort of a, some examples of where I started in my journey with food photography back in 2014, um, and you can see now how those same subjects have been reimagined with all the things that I've learned over the years. And obviously I'm still continuing to learn now um, with creating really um, awesome and appetizing imagery. So just really quickly before I go any further, I do wanna talk about um, the different types of food photography because it's a really broad industry um, and there, there are different types of food photographers. Um, you have, basically they can be generalized into two main categories. So there's the commercial side of food photography, which is gonna be, um, advertising, packaging, and food products. Um, and then there's also the um, more editorial side of things, which is going to be more leaning more towards capturing a mood or telling a story with your image. Um, and obviously these two different um, categories do have some blending going on between them. Um, but my work mostly is editorial style. So that is what I am going to be focusing on with this presentation. So let's move on to part one, which is going to be the basics. So the tools and gear that you're going to need for capturing really awesome food images. Um, here are some of the essentials that you're gonna need. Um, obviously a camera and lenses. I'll talk about more, talk in more detail on these items in other slides. Um, you're gonna need SD cards and lots of spare charged batteries. Sometimes shoots can go on for quite a long time and you don't wanna be stuck without having an extra battery. Um, you're going to need an adjustable tripod, um, preferably something with an overhead arm so you can do um, overhead or flat lay shots. Um, and as well, working with a tripod is great because it gives you a stationary frame of reference when you're styling and composing your shot, your shot, your shot. So you can see what exactly it is that your camera is seeing. Um, you're going to need a good light source, um, computer editing software, um, lots of different backgrounds and shooting surfaces. Um, as well as work tables. Um, I like to use a collapsible one so I can carry it around with me. Um, you're gonna need lots of light modifiers as well. So like diffusers, reflectors, blackboards, whiteboards, things like that. Um, you're also gonna need to have a camera bag, obviously for storing and transporting your, um, your equipment. Um, you're also gonna need to have some basic props um, if you are gonna be involved in styling your food images. Um, and as well, having a really you know, a strong imagination and a vision and a good appetite for food photography. You know, being passionate about it is going to be really important. 
And some of the non-essential equipment or things that I've invested in, uh, some of the things I've invested in slowly um, over the years, um, um, being able to tether is really important. I pretty much only tether now um, when I'm working on my food uh, photography. Uh, a C stand is, is also really helpful for doing overhead shots, um, as well as having stands and clamps for hanging different backgrounds or backdrops. Um, you can also just sort of tape them to the wall. I've done that quite a few times. Um, and then having an artificial light source, um, that may be something that you're going to want to invest in as a food photographer. Um, and having a remote shutter too. So if you're like me, not only am I the food photographer, um, I'm also the stylist and I'm also the model sometimes. So I like to be in my images. Having the ability to control my camera remotely is going to be really handy. And then as well, more props. So um, like props and backgrounds, you're just going to be adding to your collection all the time. So you'll start with a core, but then that is going to be built on over the years. And then if you are also going to be involved in styling your uh, scenes, you're going to want to um, have a, um, a food styling kit. Um, but I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. But let's talk uh, briefly about uh, the camera camera and the lenses. Now, most food photo or most photographers in general will say it's not always about your camera. Your imagination, your vision, and your passion is going to be really important, as well as the food, especially with food photography. Um, however, that being said, if you do want to make a career out of this, it's going to be really important to um, invest in a really good full frame DSLR mirrorless camera um, that can really help you realize your vision and make your workflow a lot easier. And one thing I like to have in a camera is a, a flip screen or something where you can, if you're working overhead like so, you can see what your camera is seeing by flipping the screen up. So let's talk a little bit about lenses now. So there's sort of five main um, or really good food photography lenses. Not every photographer is going to have these in their in their kit, but I can guarantee you that most food photographers will have at least one or two of these lenses. So the first one is going to be your um, your 100 or 105 millimeter macro or micro lens, and this is going to be really essential for getting up close and personal with your food, showing off lots of different textures and finer details that you might not see with the naked eye. It's also going to be really essential for photographing small foods um, so that they fill up the frame more. Um, and this lens is just a really great all around lens for food photography. You can use it for multiple different perspectives, overhead, hero, angle, close up. I'll talk about more, talk about those a little bit more uh, later on. And um, you know, this lens is a little bit um, large and you do need to position it way back um, if you are going to be trying to capture more elements in a scene, but all around a really, really solid lens for food photography. Uh, the 50 millimeter lens is also really great. Um, I love using the Nifty 50 because it's, it's versatile, um, it's compact, it's also very inexpensive, and it's great for incorporating a lot of um, negative space in your scene without causing too much distortion like you would get with a wide angle lens. Um, it's great for pretty much any perspective, but mostly I'm using my 50 millimeter for um, overhead shots, um, or for hero shots as well. Um, it doesn't really work so well for close-up work um, because it's gonna add some distortion to your subject. And as well, it's not gonna fo focus at a short distance. Uh, the 35 millimeter lens is also another lens I have in my kit. Um, this is a wide angle lens and it's really good for capturing sort of wide overhead scenes like tablescapes. Um, or scenes where you want to include a lot of different elements to help tell a little bit more of a story um, in relation to a food. Um, and it's also good for incorporating lots of negative space, um, but this lens um, does cause a little bit of distortion around the edges, so you are gonna wanna watch out for that. And the 35, I'm mostly using just for overhead shots, kind of like what you're seeing here. I don't really use it for any other um, perspectives with respect to food photography. Um, an 85 millimeter or a portrait lens is also going to be really nice to have. Um, it's great for hero images. It adds really nice compression and pulls 
your food subject into really nice, strong focus and getting some beautiful bouquet in the background. Um, this lens uh, works really well at most angles, um, maybe not so much for overhead. Um, I do find it a little bit awkward for that. Um, and because it has a really large minimum focusing distance, you do need to position the camera quite a ways back if you want to capture more in the scene. Um, as well, it's not going to work so great for doing close-up work. And then lastly is the, the tilt shift lens. And this is going to be um, really essential if you're um, a commercial food photographer. Um, it allows you to really perfectly con control the uh, plane of focus in a scene um, or on a subject without having to move your camera around or change things around in the scene. So let's talk about backgrounds now. Um, these are what are really going to help tell a story and complement your main subject. Um, typically, I like to source backgrounds in a three by four foot size. Um, it's a little bit more um, flexible in terms of using it for different um, perspectives and for different sized subjects. Um, as well, you know, with your backdrops, you're going to want to invest in um, a variety of colors and also a variety of textures to help um, play off whatever it is that your your food is. So just some examples here of what I've used stones um, or tiles that you can get from a hardware store. They're relatively inexpensive. They are quite heavy though, but they work really well. Um, you can get vinyl printed surfaces, which are actually my absolute favorite thing to shoot on because they're so lightweight, they're easy to store and you can get them in so many different styles. You can also shoot on wood. Um, however, I am going to say if you are gonna find um, wood from a hardware store, make sure that it's not treated wood um, because that's obviously not gonna be food safe. And you can go for canvas backdrops as well. You can use those to create your own, just paint on them and then seal them to make them food safe. Um, you can use linens or fabrics as well, um, or also invest in professionally crafted backgrounds. They tend to be a little bit more expensive, um, but they're definitely worth every penny. And you can also definitely get creative with um, different backdrops. So using parchment paper, you can use brown paper, um, cookie sheets, things like that. And your props. So props are also going to complement your main food subject and help tell a bit of a story. Um, you're going to want to find props that are timeless, that you can sort of use repeatedly for different types of food. Um, as well, you're going to be investing in um, different glassware, flatware, serveware, dishes, containers, um, bakeware and cookware, um, all the different things that go into preparing food um, or serving food, things like that. You're going to want to invest in props that are in a variety of shapes and sizes, preferably in neutral colors or shades um, that aren't going to overpower your dish. And also go for um, matte finish because if you have a really strong uh, shiny glaze on your um, on your props, that's just going to create really massive highlights and it's and it's not going to uh, complement your food. It's really going to take away from it. So props are obviously an investment that you make over time. So don't worry if you only have a few pieces that you love and use repeatedly. And where source props. So you can find them at thrift stores. Um, antique shops are great. Um, you know, asking family or friends or just using what you have around the house. Um, the other thing that I really uh, like is sourcing them from uh, local ceramic artists. You can find some really beautiful, unique pieces that way. Um, online shops. And of course, if you have the option to rent props, definitely do that. So let's move on to part two, which is the components of food photography. So how do you compose how do you light and how do you shoot um, food or food images? And there's sort of five main components being, um, you know, the story. So knowing the story of the food and how you want to enhance that, uh, the lighting, um, composition, styling, and then your camera settings. So let's talk about the story first. Um, so the objective with 
the story is what is it that you want to convey or invoke or evoke with the image so do you want to evoke a certain mood um, or a feeling um, do you want to go for something bright and modern um, or you know evoke a, a feeling of a certain season or a geographical location um, and once you know sort of the story you want to tell then you can decide how you're going to work the light um, your composition, your styling, and your setting. So just to give you an example with this image here, this is a soup, which instantly evokes the feeling of you know, warmth and comfort, maybe winter time. So I've played off of that with the food by keeping the tones a bit cooler, a little bit on the darker side. And then I've added in the blanket to really emphasize that cozy feeling. And sometimes you don't have to work with just one image telling a story, you sometimes have the option to use multiple image, multiple images to tell a story. Like this example here, where we've got, you know, a forager in the woods, these beautiful golden chanterelles that he's going to bring back to his rustic cabin to create this um, wild mushroom soup. So now let's talk about light. Um, light is obviously integral to all food photo all photography in general, um, also with food photography. Um, whenever I am going to start a shoot, I'm always assessing the light first because that is going to affect how how I approach it and how I'm going to um, or whether I'm going to need additional equipment. Now, lighting is obviously a really big topic, um, and there's lots of different ways to work with light when it comes to food photography. Um, and I shoot primarily with natural light, so I'm gonna focus mostly on that and then the techniques that I use to light my scenes most often in my images. But just to quickly touch on natural versus artificial light, um, obviously natural light is gonna fluctuate a lot during the day in, in temperature, um, intensity, based on so many different factors that I've listed here. So it's highly variable. It's also unstable, um, but it is also free um, and it's quite easy to use. I primarily shoot with natural light or sorry, I actually only shoot with natural light just because my shooting space doesn't really accommodate having um, having artificial an artificial setup. That being said, though, artificial is definitely going to be a good choice for you if you are limited in natural light, um, if you're constrained to shooting later in the day. So it offers way more flexibility um, as well as it, it's going to give you a lot of consistency. And this is important if you're doing a lot of commercial work. So let's talk a little bit about some lighting techniques. So how, um, how you can use light to or manipulate natural light um, to create some really uh, great food images. So you can look at the direction of the light, the amount and intensity of the light, uh, the distance your subject is from the light source, as well as how to shape and sculpt it. So the direction is gonna be really important because certain foods are gonna look way better lit from certain angles. Um, now, side lighting is obviously really popular. It works actually for pretty much all food. Um, it's very flattering and adds really nice tonal depth. Um, however, there are instances where backlighting is gonna be your best friend with food. And anything that has a lot of nice texture, anything that's glowy or glistening or transparent drinks in particular are gonna look really, really beautiful with backlighting. So just to give you the example here, we've got the exact same subject. One, I've lit it from the side and eh, you know, it doesn't really do much for me, this image. Whereas just changing the orientation of the light your camera really makes this image come alive and pop, pop for me. So you can see now it's highlighting all the beautiful um, ice crystals in the drink. It's also giving you this really beautiful green hue along the bottom rim and the, um, the lime um, on the rim of the glass is also nicely lit up. Um, so I'm not gonna talk too much about front lighting because I find that it just lacks way too much dimension for food. Um, and it's, I don't think it's very common or flattering, so I'm not really gonna talk too, too much about uh, front lighting. But let's talk about the amount and intensity of the light. So um, with food photography, like most photography, 
um, having soft light is going to be really flattering for your subject. Um, so um, you can use modifiers to control the intensity of the light, but you can also use them to help set a mood. So for example, doing a dark and moody scene, you can use curtains or blackboards to help block out and control the amount of light coming into your scene um, and get some nice deep shadows. Um, and if you wanna go for something a little more light and airy, then you can use reflectors or whiteboards to bounce light into your scene and um, lose some of the intensity in the shadows there. Uh, that being said though, as wonderful as working with soft light is for food, there is also a case for working with harsh light, which is that really intense, direct, undiffused sunlight coming through your window, which is gonna create lots of really bold highlights, some stark, sh long shadows in your image. It's, it's quite edgy and it gives a really nice um, summer, outdoor summertime feel to uh, a food scene. So the distance, so how, close or far away you place your, sub your subject to the light, it's gonna affect the amount of contrast, the intensity of the light on it. So the closer you are, the more contrast, the darker and shorter the shadows are going to be and the punchier the highlights are. And then if you move your food a little bit further away, then you're gonna get less contrast, softer, longer shadows, um, less intense highlights. Um, this can sometimes cause your food to look a little bit flat and lack dimension. So for me personally, I try to shoot within two to three feet of my light source, um, usually not more than that, but um, it really depends on the food and playing around with different distances um, for a particular food subject um, will help you find what works best. Um, now this image here is actually an example of me where I've shot really, really close up to the light and you can see just how much contrast I've created in this image here with this delicious cinnamon bun. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about shaping light. So how can we tailor or sculpt the incoming light to add highlights um, or shadows maybe where there were none before and to really emphasize th certain aspects of food? So you can use flags or um, blackboards um, to create shadows and depth you can also, you know, use curtains over your window to create a really narrow um, amount of light, narrow light stream coming in, which is quite popular with the uh, with chiaroscuro lighting. Um, and then obviously using bounce cards or reflectors to tailor where highlights or shadows are falling on your subject. So just to elaborate a little bit more on this um, behind the scenes here, you can see where I placed this blackboard on the bottom of the window it's creating a little bit more depth and shadow on the bottom left of the screen or on the bottom left of this um, image on the left. And it's taking the focus off of the cutlery. Um, it's lessening some of the, the highlights on the actual dish. And then the food stays really nicely, strongly lit. Whereas without the blackboard, you can see that um, it's brighter, um, but it is gonna lack some of the depth and dimension of the, um, the other image. And you can see that the cutlery is a little bit more lit. Now, obviously you can edit your photos, you know, in post-processing, but I find it looks a lot more natural if you can do it while you are in the process of creating, creating your scene. So now let's move on to talking about composition. Um, this is obviously a really big topic and there's so many different ways to compose a food image to make it look good. But overall, the objectives with composition are how to let the viewer know what it is that they're supposed to be looking at and how to help the viewer's eye flow through an image and how to make it aesthetically pleasing and well-balanced. So how do we achieve good composition with our food images? Well, we want to create a sense of balance and visual flow by strategic placement of props and or your main subject along grid lines or within grid spaces, and I'll give you examples of these in a minute here. Using negative space uh, to draw focus to your main subject. Using framing, so adding an, a frame within your image frame to help emphasize the main subject, as well as what perspective you're taking with your food. So um, choosing the right perspective for the right subject is gonna really help make sure your subject doesn't get lost in the scene, essentially. 
So here's some examples of some compositional techniques that I like to use. Uh, the first one here is the rule of thirds, which is really common. Um, most of the scene is happening in the bottom two thirds of the image. The two drinks are actually placed along the vertical, um, the vertical grid lines. And then the main focal drink in the front there is actually placed along the vertical and the horizontal um, axis right there. Um, that creates a really nice, strong composition. The golden triangles is another one that I like to use. And this is working on diagonal flow versus the horizontal and vertical, where you can see this image is divided into two main triangles and then divided again into two um, smaller triangles where, I, and I've placed the items sort of respectively either on or within those triangles there to create a nice composition. And the S curve is obviously really popular for uh, a lot of food photographers. It's pretty self-explanatory in creating a really nice visual flow around your subject. And the last one that um, I'll show you here is the C curve, uh, which gives the viewer's eye a nice road map for where to start in the image. They know exactly where they're going here. And there's lots of other compositional techniques that you can play with. So there's the golden ratio, golden spiral, diagonals, triangles. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can have fun with um, composition in your food styling or your, your food images. Uh, so negative space, uh, again, this is going to create a really strong focus on your main subject without a lot of distractions happening. Um, the viewer is going to know exactly sort of where to focus their attention pretty much right off the bat. And these images are pretty self-explanatory. You can see lots of like, negative space here um, surrounding your subject. Uh, so framing. So this is creating smaller frames within the larger image frame. And these also help to draw um, a lot of um, focus on your main subject. Um, the first one here that I'll show you is where I've used items in the foreground and the background that are blurred out, which create a frame around this pasta dish here, um, or these blurred out uh, florals in the foreground um, with a slice of cake on a piece of, on a, on a plate here. And then the um, basket here with the tomatoes, the tomatoes being the main focus. Um, and then I've used the basket as also an additional frame. So you know exactly where to look in this image. But let's talk about perspective now. So this is finding the subject's best side um, for composition and then orienting your camera to that. So there's really four main orientations used in food photography. Um, the first one being the hero. Uh, which is usually shot, well, it is shot straight on. It's really good for anything that has height to it or anything that's stacked. So like um, a layer cake, um, a cookie stack, pancakes, um, burgers, sandwiches, anything where you really want to emphasize um, the height and the layers of something. And the overhead perspective is going to work really, really well if you are shooting a flat food. Um, so, for example, cookies on a cooling rack, um, a casserole, soups with really beautiful garnishes on top. Um, it's also good for shooting any type of food that has a really unique shape that you want to emphasize. So like a, a beautiful pie lattice um, or cutout cookies. Um, the overhead shot is also great for uh, doing tablescapes or entertaining scenes, as you can see here. Basically, this, this angle or this perspective is going to be really great for anything where you want to emphasize uh, the top of a food, the shape of a food, or various other elements within the scene. And the other perspective, um, and the one that I really like, is the um, angled, sometimes called the three-quartered shot. Um, and this is taken anywhere between 30 and 70 degrees. Um, and this is going to be really good for foods that have a lot of several, or that have several interesting points to them. So for example, um, this apple cake here on the right, you can see in this image, I'm wanting to show off sort of the crumb of the cake, but also the beautiful apples on top. And this uh, perspective also really works well for um, food or scenes where you want to have a lot of, you know, elements in the foreground and the background to help tell a little bit more of a story about the food. And this is obviously a popular angle for a lot of food photographers because this is what we see when we sit down at the table to eat our food. So really, really strong perspective to take. Um, 
And the other one is also the close up, which is also a really, I, I love doing close ups because they're gonna show off all the little details and textures of your food. Now these can be some of the most mouth watering images that you can produce. Um, they really help the viewer, <coughs> excuse me. They really help the viewer imagine the taste of the food and the texture of it in their mouth. And now, obviously it's important to know what it is that is appetizing about the subject that you're shooting and really focus in on that with your camera. So for example, we've got, um, you know, these tomatoes here that are slathered in olive oil and they've got tons of, you know, salt on top. It, just, it looks really juicy and this is tempting more than just my sight. It actually makes me feel like I can eat juicy tomatoes, right? <clears throat> oh, excuse me. We have a little bit of water here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, styling now. So um, the objective with styling your food scenes is how can you make the food look really appetizing, make it look its best, and how can you complement it without it looking forced? So number one, how to make the food look good. Um, you're obviously going to have to take a lot of care when it comes to preparing the dish if you're going to be involved in that as the food photographer. Um, you know, if you have cookies that are slightly burnt, it's not going to be a problem if you're just going to be eating them. But if you are shooting them on, if they're going to be on camera, that is going to translate onto your image. So um, make sure the food is looking as best as it can and as perfect as it can. And then keep the food really fresh. So I am preparing and or assembling my food the day of my shoot um, as much as possible. And that's going to help it look the, as best as possible um, for the duration of my shoot. And then obviously enhancing the food by using beautiful garnishes like microgreens on top of a salad or edible flowers, icing sugar, or for example, here with this eggnog, um, you know, I've added the, um, the cinnamon stick in there and a little bit of cinnamon on top just to really enhance the dish itself and make it look pleasing. So the other aspect is, or the other objective is, um, how do you style your scene to complement the main dish? So your main dish looks good. How can you complement it um, and also add interest? And also, how can you keep it looking natural? So there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, these are some of the ways that I do it, and I'll show you some examples here, but using various textures within a scene, a food scene. So, you know, when we're looking at food in real life, there is lots of textures going on in our visual field. Um, and the same goes for like layers and, and heights. We have lots of that going on as well. Um, there's also the option to use color theory to really enhance your food subject. And then using things like the rule of odds and repeating shapes and patterns. And there's also the option to just, you know, have very minimal or no styling involved with your food, like no distractions whatsoever. So just to give you some examples of those, um, this ice cream here is obviously shot very minimally, um, but it, there's a little bit more going on because I've added the element of the ice cream slowly um, melting and dripping down the side. So while it is very minimally styled, there's still a lot going on here that you can see. Um, and the next image is an example of using a repeating shape um, or and the rule of odds. So for example, we've got three um, triangular slices of this cake and they are sitting on three plates. So three being an odd number. That's just really pleasing to look at. And then using layers and height. So I've stacked these cookies one on top of each other and then I've added an additional layer of um, the napkin underneath them. And then we've also got varying heights between the milk jug in the background and the height of the cookies as well. And then using lots of interesting textures that work with the foods. For, so for example, this, um, this galette here, we've got the stone background texture. We've got the texture of the parchment paper, the texture of the food itself, and then the textures of the natural elements between the fresh fruit and um, the leaves there. <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about styling with using color theory. So 
being able to uh, complement your food subject with color is going to make it look really good as well um, and, and create a really harmonious image. So um, you can see with this example, this pasta is sort of on the yellowy orange side um, and a complementary color to that pasta would be a, a blue. So I've chosen the blue dish for this to really help this image, um, you know, stand out, feel harmonious um, and really um, complement the food. And you can definitely invest in your own color wheel. Um, I actually like to use uh, one online. Um, you can just search Adobe color wheel and you can use the same tool here to create, you know, complementary color schemes or monochromatic or analogous color schemes. So let's talk a little bit more about how to make a food scene look natural. Um, now, one way I like to do that is to space things unevenly. So while the human eye is really drawn to symmetry, while we really love to look at symmetry, I find that if you can just add a little touch of asymmetry in a scene, um, we'll add some interest, but it will also add that natural element with your styling. Uh, grouping items together and overlapping items. So for example, this tart here, um, you can see with the spoon and the fork, I sort of overlapped those two things together and then grouped a bunch of forks and knives together. Um, that can help things look natural as well. And then adding the human elements. So whether you want to have your hands in the frame, um, you know, somebody preparing bread dough, for example. And then I also like to try to leave some things partially out of the frame or, you know, anchoring my images, so to speak. So uh, the example here with this tart where I've left the dish, slight one dish off the frame um, in the upper corner. And this is going to give the viewer a sense that they're just getting a glimpse of a more larger realistic set um, or a real life setting. And other ways to help make your scene look natural um, is to, you know, make it look lived in. So adding, you know, little crumbs or adding drips uh, or, you know, a half eaten plate of food or noodles wrapped around a fork, right? Those are all really awesome ways to, um, to style your food. And now just in general, obviously there's, again, so many ways that you can style a food scene, but, um, and sometimes having too many options can make things a little bit complicated. Um, but what I like to do is always ask myself two questions when I'm styling a scene and choosing props. I'm asking number one, does this prop, item, color, or ingredient enhance or distract from my main subject? And two, does it make sense for the scene or the story that I'm trying to tell about this food? And if you ask yourself those two questions, you can really start to um, set yourself on the right path for styling your food scenes. Now let's talk about image settings. This is the last part of part two. Um, so your settings obviously are all gonna depend on what type of food you're shooting, um, the perspective you're taking, the light, um, as well as your creative vision. Um, but one thing I will say is to be mindful to set custom white balance because the color of your food is really important for making it look appealing and appetizing to the viewer and capturing it in its truest colors. Um, and here I've just listed some basic aperture settings when it comes to the different perspectives for food photography. I won't go into too, too much detail with those, um, but I will touch on freezing action because that is, can be really engaging and fun for, to create and as well as to look at. Um, so when you're, um, when you're freezing action, you're obviously working with your shutter speed. Um, and I'm usually at you know, one over 200th of a second. Um, but it really does depend on the item or the, the food that's moving in the scene and like its weight and its viscosity, for example. So you can see in the example with the powdered sugar, I wanted to capture little individual flecks of um, the powdered sugar being dusted, but I also wanted to show a little bit of motion blur. Um, so I shot that at one over 320th of a second. Um, the dressing was a little bit of a thicker, it has a bit of a thicker viscosity. It, it flows a bit slower. So I was able to use a um, one over 250th of a second for that, um, for freezing that motion there. 
Um, but obviously with when it comes to capturing motion, you are going to be playing around with that a lot, um, depending on what it is that you're shooting. So just have fun with it. Okay. So we've covered all the components of food photography now. That was a lot. Thank you so much for making it this far. Um, let's move on to part three now, which is how do you piece all those components together to create a nice cohesive food scene? So we're gonna study this image here that I created. Um, so let's start with the story. So what I was trying to convey with this image is you know, summertime in a nice cool kitchen, um, making a simple seasonal dessert in the summertime. Um, I've got a, a little bit of a French artisanal feel going on for a dessert that is actually a traditional French dessert, this galette. Um, my light, I, am, I chose side lighting uh, for this dessert. I've controlled the intensity of the light in the scene with only partial diffusion. Um, I did shoot this on a sunny day, um, but I find I only really needed partial diffusion for this scene. Um, I've shaped the light by using one blackboard in the upper uh, right, or sorry, upper left of the image where the strawberries are, um, just to take some of the highlight off of them and really keep uh, my main subject lit, lit best. And I've also placed my subject about two feet away from the window to keep some nice, um, some nice depth and contrast in my image. Um, the composition. So you can see I've used a couple different compositional techniques here where I've styled the strawberries in a bit of an S curve right around the main subject. I've also used um, some negative space right next to my, my main subject. So nothing is distracting from it. Um, and I've also shot this um, from, I've composed it from the overhead perspective because I'm shooting a flat food um, that has a really interesting top. And I'm also wanting to um, um, show a little bit more of the larger scene going on here. In terms of styling, I've used lots of different styling techniques. I've used a repeating round pattern that really complements the roundness of the galette. Um, I've used anchoring. So you can see the strawberries are flowing into and off of the scene, um, as well as the bowl that's placed slightly off of, off of camera. Um, as well, I've used uh, color theory. So there's obviously a lot of red going on in this image and a complementary uh, color to red is green. So I've used some greenery there to um, complement that. Um, the, my props that I've chosen, um, again, I was going for sort of a rustic country French vibe. So the props are kind of playing into that as well um, with, you know, the rustic paring knife, which is actually from France. <laughs> um, and then I've also made my scene look as natural as possible by, you know, including little drips of ice cream in there um, and then some crumbs um, as well. And then lastly, I'm just going to show you my settings. These are pretty self-explanatory. Um, but again, that's obviously going to depend on, you know, your lighting and what's going on there. So, so there you go. Um, now let's talk about some tips and um, some troubleshooting as it pertains to food photography. And these are things that I've learned over the years through experience, um, sometimes learning it the hard way as well. So you may find this really helpful. Um, so number one, I cannot stress this enough though. I've already said it, but make sure your food looks good. This is so important because if your food doesn't look good, it doesn't matter how well you've composed or styled or lit your shot. It's your image isn't going to look good. So number one, focus on that. Um, use stand-ins. So, you know, food will obviously degrade over time, um, more depending on the type of food. Like, for example, ice cream will melt um, and lettuce starts to wilt. So use a bare plate or an object to stand in for that food while you're composing and styling your scene. And that will make sure the food is going to stay looking its absolute best while you're actively shooting it. And planning as well is going to be really important. So either sketch out, storyboard, or mentally plan each shot so that you are um, managing your time really well because styling and composing can take, you know, can take quite a bit of time. Um, so you want to make sure that you're working as fast as possible. So your food is also staying looking good for us um, for the duration of your shoot. 
And as well, if you're working with natural light, you're going to need to be really on your heels um, or on your toes, sorry, because um, you only have a certain window during the day in which to shoot. So with styling and um, shooting salads or greens, um, you're going to want to use minimal dressing because dressing will start to wilt the lettuce and make it just look not so good. So what I like to do is just drop um, salad dressing strategically over focal points on the salad. Um, and as well, you're going to want to make sure your greens stay nice and crisp and fresh. So keeping them in the fridge until the absolute last second when you need to bring them onto the scene um, or keeping them wrapped in a wet paper towel. Um, you can use fake alcohol. Um, obviously this depends because with commercial food photography, sometimes you have to use the actual product. So um, this is gonna be, this is gonna depend on the type of food photography you do. But you can use like apple juice or diluted coffee or food colored water, um, which is gonna make uh, for an inexpensive stand in. Um, with styling linens, they can be really tricky um, and stiff sometimes. So one trick you can try is actually spritzing them with a little bit, um, just spritzing them lightly with a little bit of water. And that will help them sort of hold a shape more that looks natural. Um, if you are, when it comes to storing your linens, um, I just like to store um, them in a big pile <laughs> because the wrinkles I find can add some nice texture to your images um, and it also makes them a little bit easier to style. Uh, for soups, um, one trick that is very common is to use a ramekin um, that is placed um, in the bowl and then your soup goes on top and the ramekin acts then as a little stage where you can put your garnishes so that they don't sink to the bottom of the soup. Um, and also using shallower bowls for soup is going to be really helpful because then you don't have to use so much of the product to fill up the bowl and you're not going to get so um, too much shadow happening from the, uh, the edge of the bowl on the surface of the soup. With brown foods, they can be a little bit boring, like casseroles, for example. So uh, I like to add colorful garnishes or like interesting props like spoons or serveware. Um, just to help make it not so boring. Um, and also with brown food, you can, you can also work the monochromatic um, coloring, you know, which can also be really pleasing. And if you're working with hot foods, make sure you let them cool down to room temperature first before you bring them onto the scene, because otherwise if they're steaming, it's gonna fog up your camera lens. Um, and as well, if they're hot, they may damage your shooting surface and I definitely did that, so don't make that mistake. Um, as well, you're going to want to try multiple angles during any one given shoot. Um, this is what food photographers or professional food photographers do. You want to exhaust as many um, angles as possible. If you're doing a client shoot, this is going to give them lots of options to choose from. Um, so I've used here, you can see um, this soup. I've shot it from a vertical overhead. Um, and now I'm shooting it um, backlit and horizontal from a three quarter angle. Um, buy more than what you think you might need. So you're going to need ingredients if you're preparing the food. They're, they're going to go into the food itself, but you're going to need more to also style your scene as well. Sometimes it happens that a food is going to get bruised or damaged. So making sure you have um, additional food to stand in for that and you're not gonna be left stranded or having to run out to the store at the last minute while your food is deflating. Um, and obviously you want to spend a lot of time studying food images that you're drawn to. Um, this is gonna help you so much in understanding what it is that looks good or, and what it is that you're drawn to um, and then how you can apply that to your own work um, to make some really stellar and appetizing food images. And then lastly, is just to practice a lot. Um, you know, so much of food photography now is just intuitive because I've been doing it for so long and I've shot so many different foods that um, I just know the right angle to choose for a certain subject, the focal points I want to take, um, you know, how I want to style and compose it, right? So, um, that is actually it. Thank you so much for making it through this long presentation about uh, food photography. Um, 
Thank you so much, Nikon Canada, for having me. Um, if you want to connect with me, I've left my email there. Um, feel free to ask me questions or whatever you like. I've left my portfolio there as well. And you can connect with me uh, on Instagram as well at The Simple Green. So thank you so much, everybody. Take care.